So, here we are again, folks, in the middle of rugby. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Paul, I'm the lead pastor of Beck, and it really is so good you can join us today. Um, before we get stuck into worship and uh, family feedback, uh, just one or two bits of news. Um, essentially, do have a look on our website, all information there, children's pack, youth work, all sorts of things. If you're interested in uh, journeying with us uh, more intimately, as it were, we have life groups. It's a great place to get to know people. They've been running through this season. So uh, do get in touch through the website. If anyone's interested in being baptised, uh, we have been looking at ways to do that. Uh, we're not quite sure, obviously, recent um, guidelines have been reissued, um, but do get in touch if you're interested, if you feel the Lord's, uh, this is your time to be baptised, we think it's biblical, uh, do get in touch and let us know and we'll get into conversation with you. And just one final thing. Uh, we've been advertising an operations team leader, as many of you will know, and we're delighted to tell you that we've appointed Abby Shatade to that role. Uh, hopefully a pick of Abby and perhaps her family are going to come up now. Uh, Abby's been journeying with us. She's a young mum and a strong Christian character. If you know her, you will know her story and brings uh, a wealth of experience in uh, multinational companies and uh, just very apt for the role we're looking at. So we're very excited about that and uh, we're going to introduce Abby to you at a later date uh, here online. But for the time being, let's get into our service, shall we? Lord, we pray, would you bless our church? Be with individuals now, wherever they are. Bless our town. Have your hand upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was led to a passage written by American Pastor Bill Johnson based on Matthew 10, 8. When Jesus sent out his disciples, and therefore you and I, to heal the sick, cleanse the lep lepers, raise the dead and cast out demons. Bill Johnson says, we were born to rule. Rule over creation, over darkness, to plunder hell to rescue those headed there and to establish the rule of Jesus wherever we go by preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom means king's domain, king's dominion. In the original purpose of God, humankind ruled over creation. Now that sin has entered the world, creation's been infected by darkness, such as disease, COVID-19, sickness, afflicting spirits, poverty, natural disasters and demonic influence. Our rule is still over creation, but now it is focused on exposing and undoing the works of the devil. We are to give what we have received to reach that end. If I truly receive power from an encounter with the God of power, I am equipped to give it away. The invasion of God into impossible situations comes through a people who have received power from on high and have learned to release it into the circumstances of life. That's us. David truly believed in the power of God for the impossible. As he stood before Goliath, he knew that he was there in the power of the living God and trusted that he wouldn't let him down. And he didn't. As we trust Almighty God for our impossible situations and to follow his lead, we will begin to see circumstances changed in our own lives and that of our communities. Let us once more believe we will see the sick healed both mentally and physically. Hatred and abuse will diminish. An end to poverty, unemployment, loneliness and isolation. 
Those who have been held captive by fear will be set free to be the people Father God intended them to be. The list is endless. We know that this won't happen overnight, but if we really believe and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, anything is possible. So church family, let's dream big and work towards bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Hello, my name's Richard. I've got a wonderful title, Professor of Supply Chain Strategy. But what on earth does that mean? Well, I see my job as challenging and inspiring supply chain and business leaders to innovate. But innovation is all about taking ideas which are new to you and creating economic, social or environmental value. So if we want businesses to thrive, they need to think about those three elements of people, profits, but also the planet. Now, one of my secret textbooks on this is actually this book here. Because in here, there are loads of examples of how supply chains work. Going back to ancient times, but we can take ideas from there and apply them today to create businesses that thrive and flourish. For example, if we read Genesis, Genesis 41, 47 to 57, Joseph, basically, he's probably one of the first warehouse managers. If we think about Genesis 47 to 23 and 31, he exploits his uh, supply chain capability to benefit Egypt and the world at that time. If we have a look at 1 Kings 5, we see the temple supply chain being described in a collaborative relationship between Solomon and Hiram. In 1 Kings 9, 26 to 28 and 1 Kings 10, 11 to 12, ships were created to move gold around. But also in those verses a little bit further on, we start to actually see in 1 Kings 10, 28 to 29, an import business was also started. Ezekiel actually describes the tyre supply chain. By the way, not the rubber type of tyre, but um, the name of a place in the Bible called Tyre. And in Proverbs 31, we see a fantastic description of a very capable businesswoman. So the Bible is full of ideas that we can take away and use. The key thing is, is that you and I have really important decisions to make, particularly during these challenging times. So our decisions will impact on the profitability of companies. They'll impact on the environment and also people and the society. Just one small example. If you're buying things online, for example, um, profitability is actually very challenging for businesses. But, you know, many of them are able to actually make that work during these times. But it is very challenging for businesses. For Planet, it's actually good for businesses. In fact, rather than you getting in your car and driving to the shops, so you say your diesel or your uh, petrol car, it's 20 times less CO2 is created if you get it home delivered because the van is doing about 180 drops per day. But the point is, if we buy everything online, what happens to our local community, our local town? If we don't go to the shops in rugby, for example, eventually those businesses will go out of business. So we have to think carefully about our decisions and how they impact on those three areas. But one really important bit of information in the Bible, which we really need to pay attention to, is in Isaiah 58, six to nine. It says this, this is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering and ill-clad, being available to your families. 
do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. So if we want businesses to flourish, we really need to think through some of the wisdom in this very important textbook on supply chain. Morning Church, I'm Adrian, one of the worship leaders. It's great to be here. It's great to be able to play and sing. It's great to be able to do stuff that glorifies God, that praises Him. And just so exciting. Anyway, I need you to sing with gusto this morning. I need you to be loud, proud, bold, and glorifying to God. Here we go. Come set your rule and reign. In our hearts again, increase in us we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for your adorn and prize. To see the captain's hearts release the dirt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our church and we pray revive this earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hands the last streets and land set your church on fire with this day Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power, we change the near and far. No force of hell can stop, your changing hearts. Made us for much more than this The way the kingdom seed in us Fill us with the strength and love of Christ We are your church And we are the hope on earth Build your kingdom
Hallelujah. Amen. And praise God. Come on. A declaration. A thing to do. Men of faith, stand up. Rise up and sing. Men of faith, rise up and sing Of the great and glorious King You are strong when you feel weak In your brokenness complete Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, women of the truth. Stand and sing to broken hearts. You can know the healing power of our awesome King of love. Shout to and the south sing to the east and the west Jesus the Savior to all Lord of heaven and earth rise up church with broken wings fill this place with songs again of our God who reigns on by His grace the King will fly. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Weeping through fire, weeping through Find by the power of his name, we fall in deeper in love with you. My name's Janet and I'm a member at Beck. I also teach at Ashlawn School in Rugby. It's um, a big secondary school. Now last week Mark spoke on Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Earlier today a good friend and ex-colleague of mine put a short sermon from her minister on Facebook which referred to Daniel. It was very much along the lines of Daniel in all the changing circumstances of his life, different governments, plagues, pandemics, even the lion's den. He kept his eyes focused on above all those things. He kept focused on the Lord of all, the ancient of days, Jesus, the high priest. He did not lean on his own understanding or try to gain wisdom from others. Instead, he prayed and prayed. So what might it look like if God broke through in our schools? 
What if leadership teams, other staff and students truly believed in the one true and living God? The ever-increasing number of students and staff suffering from anxiety and mental health issues would reduce dramatically. The pressure on students to gain acceptance by taking drugs, overindulge in alcohol, get involved in unhealthy relationships would significantly reduce as they find unconditional love and acceptance in Christ. The freedom to be who they were truly created to be with their God-given gifts and talents and being able to develop these with the necessary support in whatever area. A complete change in the societal norm of looking after number one to really loving and caring for those around us and always seeking to put others first. Youngsters praying about the decisions they have to make, getting wisdom and discernment could prevent many of them becoming involved in gangs and drug trafficking across county lines. Those who are angry at the things they've experienced through life would release it and have peace. They would have a secure hope for the future. In these very uncertain times when things are changing so rapidly, they would have stability. Knowing the truth when living in an age where the message they are given is that truth is anything you want it to be, would be totally transforming and liberating. The strongholds that Satan has in schools would be broken, and schools would be a place where everyone could flourish and become the people God wants them to be. Working in a school with 2,000 people, if God broke through in big style, and many of those at the school set their eyes on him rather than the things around them, not only would the school environment and the lives of those in the school be transformed, but so would the impact in the wider community be enormous. Tonight we'll hear the story of Crispy Bear. <clears throat> a long time ago, this little bear was alive because she listened to her father, so she was happy. <sighs> but Crispy had one terrible problem. She was filled with curiosity. <gasps> yes, and one day she saw something new and died. Just like that? Yes. Oh, same ending as every day. <laughs> I get it, Dad. I will never do anything new or different. Good man, Thunk. <sighs> my family has always survived by living by my dad's one rule. Never leave the cave. We never had the chance to explore the outside world. But what we didn't know was that our world was about to change. Eve, come down! Get to the cave! Go! Look out! You really need to see this. The Croods. So that was the trailer for the movie The Croods, which I think is quite an underrated film, actually, if you fancy having a look. 
It's the story of a caveman called Grug, who, in a world he sees as kind of threatening, decides to keep his family safe by keeping them in the cave. Now, in one sense, he does protect them, but the issue is this, he misses out on everything in this big, wide, colorful world around them. They just don't get to it. And it's the story of how they begin to break out and explore. It's an analogy that works on so many levels. I think many of us as Christians, we can see the world as a big, old, scary place. Maybe it's the issues inside of us. We're reluctant to explore them. We just want to, don't want to deal with them. And so what we do is we hide and hunker down and stay in our cave. Or as Christians, I think we can be good at staying in our caves as a Christian body, as the church. There are too many churches probably who have, who have just felt that what they've got to do is hang on till Jesus returns and just keep themselves safe. It's this one won't get past. So what happens to us is we don't engage with the world. Perhaps we're fearful that if we get involved, we'll get contaminated. But the problem is again this, that we're missing out, I think, on all God has for us. So that analogy from that movie just works so well. There are too many of us, individually, as Christians, maybe as churches, in spiritual lockdown. And that's what we've been thinking about for the past few weeks. And this, folks, is exactly where Israel found herself in 1 Samuel 17, the story we've been looking at for a few weeks now. Israel, you see, was in lockdown. They hadn't stepped out of the cave into the beautiful, thriving world that God had for them. They were intimidated on the battlefield, if you remember, by this guy, Goliath. They were dismayed, it says. And it required a new generation of Christian to step forward, David, who would be prepared to wear his own clothes, not try on the armour of previous generations, to do things his way, to come in faith in God, not in his own strength, and to come in God's name to honour God's name. David faces up to Goliath and last week so wonderfully told by the Cottingham family with tomato ketchup and everything, David defeats Goliath. So what happens next? Well, let's read the final part of the story, shall we? So this is 1 Samuel 17. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharaim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. And David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. So what exactly is going on here? Well, I think this is the start of the process whereby David, actually throughout his life, defeats God's and Israel's enemies. And the account here is really emphatic. 
there's a repeated word, nafal, it means to fall, that is used several times in the passage. In verse 32, David goes to King Saul and says, look, don't let anyone's hearts be troubled. And the word is fall. Don't let anyone's hearts fall to the ground, if you like. In verse 49, we see that Goliath falls. And then in verse 52, the Philistines' bodies, in the NIV it says, were strewn across the battlefield. And again, the word is their bodies had fallen. God's wanting to emphasise something here. Israel's enemies, God's enemies have fallen. Israel's confidence grows. They pursue the Philistines. It's interesting that when somebody steps out and has a go, there are others who are likely to join you. Maybe that's a word for someone listening today. And they give chase and eventually plunder the Philistines' camp. And then there's this interesting reference. And again, the Cottinghams brought this out so well last week. Goliath's head is cut off with his own sword. And what we see is actually later in the story, David goes to King Saul much later, hours later, and he's still carrying this head around. Again, it's emphatic. This has marked David. This battle has marked him. And he's not going to forget this in a hurry. He's, he's not the same man anymore. Let me tell you, the battles God puts us through will mark us and we won't be the same. We'll be changed. And he puts uh, Goliath's weapons in his own tent. He has disarmed the giant. Folks, this is important to get. It's God's intention for us that his enemies in our lives are defeated emphatically. I've started using a word, it is in scripture, it's not particularly in this story. God wants to vanquish his enemies from the battlefield. It's not just he wants them temporarily defeated. He wants to see them gone once and forever. He renders them powerless. We'll see in a minute why we continue then through trials and difficulties. And sometimes it does feel like all hell has broken loose against us. As David disarmed Goliath, you see, so Jesus disarmed Satan on the cross. I've read this verse many times in the years I've been at Beck and I'll read it again. It's just so significant for me in terms of what it says about the cross. Listen to this, Colossians 2, 15. It says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's talking about the work of Jesus in rendering Satan powerless. Uh, a theologian called Gustav Aulef, uh, back in the early 1900s, if you like, rediscovered the, the perspective on the cross, along with redemption, along with reconciliation, along with uh, penal substitution and forgiveness of sin. There is the fact that on the cross, Christ was victorious. Christus Victor was the theological strand. And it's the Father's heart then on the back of the work of Jesus on the cross to place all of Jesus' enemies under his feet. Acts 2 tells us this. Peter on the day of Pentecost says, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Father raised Jesus up. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Father goes to work then in delivering all Christ's enemies to him and placing them under his feet. Folks, there's a little verse slipped into the end of Romans 15, I think it is, that's, that Paul, he's signing off, he's saying goodbye to everyone and then he just interjects with, and by the way, Satan will soon be crushed under your feet. We can believe for victory and vanquishing in our lives. 
So why is it then that sometimes it just feels like the battle continues? It, it feels like the enemy hasn't been rendered powerless. Well, I think God in those times is often training us. He's setting us up for victory. Judges 3.2 says this, discussing the tribes of Israel entering the promised land. It says, these are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not previously had battle experience. God left some of Israel's enemies, some of the struggles in place. They weren't wholly vanquished because he was teaching Israel how to fight. He was setting them up to overcome. You do know, don't you, uh, God's favourite sporting brand. It's Nike. I've said this before. Why is that? Well, in the New Testament, the word Nike means victor or conqueror. Anytime you see the word victory, conquer, it's related to the word Nike. It's the Greek word for victory. And it's one of God's favourite words, if not one of his favourite sporting brands. So what situation are you facing individually? Where is the struggle? Is God training you to fight? Is he teaching you warfare so that you won't be intimidated going forward? Have you been wrestling with something for months, could even be years, but do you look at it and see that you are being changed in the process? And what do you see in society? Are there areas of society that you look at and frankly, you are angry about them? Maybe you look at some of the injustices, poverty, abuse, darkness in society. Is God setting you up to do something about these situations and to overcome? So what would happen if God's enemies were defeated like this. What can we expect to see, if you like, if lockdown is lifted in our lives and in society? What might a new normal look like? A new kingdom normal? Well, at the end of David's life, he bequeaths to his son Solomon the kingdom. And it's a kingdom of peace. It's interesting, I only discovered this the other day, Solomon's name derives from the Jewish word for peace, shalom. And it's a very rich word. It means when everything comes into harmony. It's not just absence of war. It's much, much more than this. It's a rich word. It means when everything prospers. It's talking about a society that flourishes. And this is what it says in 1 Chronicles 22 at the end of David's life. So David had had a heart to build a temple for God. But God tells him that David's own hands, because of the warfare he's enacted, his, he has blood on his hands. But then God says this, But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon. And I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Wouldn't you love to have bequeathed to you a kingdom, a life of peace and quiet. Particularly in these troubling times, many of us are crying out, society is crying out for peace of mind. Folks, that's exactly what the kingdom of God brings. A society, individuals who flourish. It's God's intention for his church. It's God's intention for humanity that we flourish, human flourishing. 
God wants to bring conditions together, if you like, a bit like these gardens we're in today, where just the right conditions, the right environment over time bring about flourishing and life and vivacity and energy and growth. God's got that for you and I. And it is a major biblical theme. In fact, it's a major theme in society. I'm interested to see that in the social sciences now, the whole area of human flourishing is an area of study. Well, nothing unlocks individual humans, nothing unlocks human flourishing like scripture. And so we see in Genesis 1 and 2, there is this perfect creation that we are called to shape and enjoy and bring to fruition. Just uh, by way of noting next time around, we're going to begin a new series called Creation Calling. And one of the things we're going to see there is that unfortunately, humanity, far from bringing creation to fulfillment, is that we've abused the physical creation. And we're going to look at some really um, important questions around what can be done to redeem the physical creation. It's there in Genesis 1 and 2. In the Old Testament laws, again, we see that the laws weren't just focused on the religious and the spiritual. So often we can live our Christian lives thinking it's all about the spiritual. But actually those laws encompass all aspects of life because God wants to bring his teaching, his commands to all spheres of life to unlock their potential, to bring life and flourishing to them. And so we have laws to do with the family, laws to do with how to live in community, laws actually to do with business and money lending and all of these things, farming, all aspects of life. It's why we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever thought about that prayer? We are praying there that the culture of heaven, a place that fully flourishes, would come to earth. That earth would flourish, the culture of heaven would come to earth and earth would flourish on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying for for heaven's ways to come to earth. And it's why Paul in the New Testament, in the letters, again, like the Old Testament laws, he doesn't just focus on the spiritual and religious. He focuses, he talks a lot about the all things, all things will be renewed and restored one day. And so Paul and Peter in their letters, they again talk about family life. They talk about relations to government, how we're to interact with authorities, how we're to interact with our neighbours, folks who, who wouldn't necessarily call themselves Christians. So these are significant aspects, human flourishing by virtue of the kingdom of God is a big deal in scripture. So what do we do with that? If this is true, if this is biblical, that God would vanquish his enemies and ours in order that his kingdom would come, how do we respond? Well, just a few thoughts to finish up with. Firstly, I think we have to engage with systemic issues in society. We've been thinking a lot at the present time, haven't we, about bubbles, social bubbles. And to be honest, Christians can be quite good at this. We can be good at staying in our bubble. And we've been saying we need to leave the cave. There's a great line by Martin Luther King. He looks at the story of the Good Samaritan and he says Christians effectively are really good at dealing with the symptoms of society's ills. But he says there's a bigger issue. This is what he says. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed, 
so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their way on life's journey. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Here in the town of Rugby, we're very good as the church at ministering to some of society's symptoms, homelessness, debt, food poverty, and that is absolutely tremendous. But what if we could see the kingdom come to the fabric and structures of society so that homelessness or debt, for example, were lessened in the first place? Let me ask you, what annoys you? As you look at society, maybe as you look at your town, our town, what challenges you? Could it be that God is stirring you to deal with systemic issues? Secondly, we have to think right. The potential of creation is unlocked as God's ways come to society. In, in which case, we need to understand what his ways are. We need to do our thinking. So many issues in society result from wrong thinking. We're chasing the wrong things. We think a certain course of attitude or a certain uh, habits will help us, be that individuals or as communities. But if our thinking is wrong, if it doesn't line up with scripture, it's not going to unlock the potential of creation. And we call this wrong thinking, or at least the Bible does, strongholds. Here's what Paul says about it in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds of wrong thinking. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take every cap we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What Paul's saying here is this, we tackle strongholds with biblical thinking. You remember Jesus said, the truth will set you free. The truth applied to culture, to individuals' lives, to community life, will set communities, individuals and societies free. So have we done our thinking? As parents, have we looked into what leads to a flourishing of a family? As parents and perhaps teachers, have we done our thinking about education? You know, I, I trained as a history teacher, but it wasn't until several years into a job that I realised actually I need to get to grips with a biblical perspective on education, on young people, on my subject, history in order to bring flourishing to it. What about the business world? What about politics or medicine? All of these areas, we need to understand what the biblical teaching is in order that these areas might flourish. And then thirdly, I think we should commit and take responsibility for geographical localities like the one you see behind me here. You know, geography is important, isn't it? We said we think we've been scattered in this season back into neighbourhoods and into geography. The motto of the town of Rugby, it's written on the town hall, is this, Floriat Rugbya. It means let rugby flourish. That should be our concern as believers, certainly if we live in this locality. But wherever you are, wherever you're watching, whatever your geography is, its well-being should concern you. You should have a heart that it flourishes. I think churches committed to localities, we probably underestimate our potential to bring healthy change. 
in rugby, we have a good network of churches called Revive. Maybe our unity is key to bringing a flourishing to the town of rugby. But even on a smaller scale, individual life groups or clusters. At Beck Church, we have clusters seeking to reach the Admiral's locality and the Corston locality. Even smaller groups, as we engage with neighbours, as we pray, as we prayer walk, as we seek to become part of the fabric of what's going on, as we connect with local schools or local institutions, we can see those areas flourish in a way I think is very unexpected. And then finally, I think we should engage in particular spheres of society, even on a small scale. At Beck, there are a couple of members, Derek and Carmelita Egan, and they run the Warwickshire Christian Business Leaders Group. And I think the details will come up on the screen here. There's a website and an email to connect with. And it's for um, people who run their own small businesses. They have breakfast, there's mutual encouragement, and they help one another think through issues. That's just an example of Christians connecting at a local, perhaps mustard seed level to see the kingdom grow in that particular sphere. And surely it's possible in some of the other spheres of life. So let's just wrap this up, shall we? I remember visiting the Imperial War Museum in London one time and there was an exhibit, it was actually on the Holocaust, but it portrayed Jewish culture in the 30s, uh, 20s and 30s in Germany. And I saw that there was a strong subculture there. The Jews ran their own youth organisations. They held their own music festivals. And of course, they had very distinctive religious practices. But perhaps they were a bit detached from society and unengaged. In the language we've been using today, it may be that they were a little bit in their protective cave. And of course, very sadly, there were then too few allies who came to support them when they needed it. And it just struck me, is that us as Christians? Have we created a subculture where we have our separate youth activities? We want our children to grow up perhaps with other Christian young people because we think they'll become nice kids then. And maybe we don't equip them for society. Or we have the Christian music industry and of course we have distinctive religious practices. But the danger is that we might become unengaged and irrelevant. And heaven forbid that we wouldn't have support in society if it became difficult for us. So today we've been out and about in rugby and we've enjoyed the flourishing gardens of Coldicott Park. But as believers, we need to get out of our Christian caves, our places of security. We need to take some risks if we're going to lift any spiritual lockdown we might be in. But I want to encourage us, let's be very optimistic that God wants his kingdom to come. It's why Jesus taught us to pray that. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And let's be hopeful that we can see society flourish as biblical ways impact all spheres of life at all levels for the benefit of all. And particularly at this time, when everything just seems to be up in the air, when old securities are dissolving and when we know resources of government and other agencies are going to be a little bit tighter. Is this an opportune time for the church to step up and step out and to bring about, by God's grace, a new kingdom normal? God bless you.
has my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all the Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then on the third. At break of dawn, the sun of heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roll, Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise. so majestic, so magnificent, more than we can ever dream of, more than we can ever hope for, more than we can ever imagine. Thank you. Who is there like you? Could repay you 
lifting up my hands, lifting up my voice, lifting up your name. In your grace I rest, for your love has come to me and said, Trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood, know your faithfulness, for your power work in me is changing me. Who is there like you? And who else would give their life for me? Even suffering in my place. And who could we? Trusting in your blood and all your faithfulness, for your power at work in me is changing me. So I'm lifting up my hands, lifting up my voice, lifting up your your grace I rest for your love has come to me and set me free and I'm trusting in your word trusting in your cross trusting in your blood and all your faithfulness for your power at work in me is changing me for your power at work in me is changing Changing me. So here we are in front of the town hall and to finish our time together, and thanks for being with us, why don't we pray together? Lord, we do ask in the busyness of this town, in the busyness of our lives, we ask that your kingdom would come, 
May we learn and understand and obey your ways. May we align, may we walk in obedience. May we yield, submit. And we pray, Father, as we do that, that your kingdom would indeed come, that our enemies would fall, that we would see strongholds demolished. And Lord, I wanna pray for our town. We pray, let rugby flourish. But Lord, I pray as well, wherever we are, would your kingdom grow? May our villages, our towns, our families flourish. So Father, come by your Holy Spirit, fill us this week to be all we can be in you. Help us to be bold. Let us not get stuck in our caves, but help us to step out and live lives that glorify you as David did. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.